and did a three-year postdoctoral research fellowship in cardiac genetics at the University of Michigan. He's been incredibly productive. Um, his research laboratory focuses on efforts to elucidate the mechanisms by which mutations in genes associate with inherited cardiomyopathy and alter molecular signals to cause decompensation and heart failure. And to do this, he uses pluripotent stem cells and um, other uh, analysis tools, which he's gonna share with us today. He's currently supported by a K08, um, which is titled Genome Engineered Stem Cell Models to Determine Disease Mechanisms in Myosin Binding Protein C3 Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy, and has won several honors and awards and is published in a wide variety of high-level journals with his most recent publication in JCI Insight um, in uh, 2020 on the effects of myosin binding protein C3 loss of function mutations preceding hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, Adam is also a really interesting and wonderful guy. He has a couple of boys at home and was a collegiate uh, club cyclist, which is an interest I share with him. I also was a collegiate club, club, club cyclist here at Yale, but he's maintained his, his cycling efforts over the years. And we had a little chat about that before Grand Rounds. Um, so hopefully someday when you can come to visit, um, we can go out for a bike ride together. I look forward to that once this whole pandemic is behind us. So welcome, Adam. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And I, one last word here, um, we are, uh, this, this Grand Rounds actually invitation comes, comes from me and also Rachel Lampert, who are working together to try to bring some of these talks to Grand Rounds. And we have another one upcoming from Charlene Day, for which uh, Dr. Lampert will do the introduction, uh, but it's really a team effort. So thank you, Rachel. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this. I'm going to Okay. Um, so uh, again, thank you. Uh, I think it has been a very exciting time in the field of inherited cardiomyopathies. And in particularly in the last decade, the improvements in genetic and molecular diagnosis have really led to a tremendous improvement in our understanding of the pathogenesis and management of these conditions. Um, so uh, since Dan has, told me that you have a, a range of clinicians and basic scientists um, across a broad range of uh, interest areas. Um, I was gonna uh, cover both some topics that I, I thought would be interesting from both a, a purely clinical standpoint at the intersection of genetics and clinical management as, as well as some of the work I've done with IPS cardiomyocytes. So the first section, um, I'm going to talk about familial and non-familial HCM and how our current understanding is, is really that HCM is two different diseases. I'm going to try to build a case and explain why I think that's critically important, both for management and for um, research efforts. So I'm going to start with two cases. In the first case, this individual presented at age 23 with HCM, um, really quite substantial hypertrophy throughout the septum, as you can see at the image to the left. And the hypertrophy follows what we refer to as a reverse curve pattern where the thickening increases moving from the basilar to the mid-septum, uh, reaching around 30 millimeters here at the mid-septum. Um, at age 24, he had an ICD implanted. Age 25, had uh, developed severe outflow tract obstruction, was treated with a myectomy. At age 28, had an appropriate shock at age 34 had developed diuretic requiring heart failure. And at age 36 developed atrial fibrillation, further complicating his heart failure management. In the second patient who is a prototypical late age presentation HCM with negative genetic testing, this individual presented at age 65, hypertrophy was pri primarily limited to the basilar septum as seen at the image at the left. Um, he also had outflow tract obstruction, was treated with myectomy, um, also developed atrial fibrillation, but at age 73, this was managed medically, and at age 78, had developed chronic diastolic heart failure. So we now know from cases like these and combining the information from genetics that we can um, predict clearly the likelihood of genetic testing being positive in individuals with HCM by their clinical profile. And this was first shown by 
Binder et al. at the Mayo Clinic in 2006, and they had a, a very nice and simple series of patients and reported their clinical features and, and uh, probability of the genetic test being positive for a sarcomere gene mutation. And very clearly this category where individuals manifested the reverse curve pattern of hypertrophy with the most bulky thickening in the mid-septum had a much higher yield of positive genetic test results. This result has since been replicated by others, including our own group in 2017. Um, other centers have subsequently uh, developed clinical scoring uh, uh, or clinical scores that identify the likelihood of a positive genetic test. Um, shown here at the top is a ROC curve showing that there is reasonably high sensitivity and specificity of using these clinical scoring systems to predict the likelihood of a positive genetic test. And at bottom, although there is overlap in the center, we see two distinct groups that um, uh, that are different in terms of both clinical profile and genetic test results. But the importance of this separation is not only just to predict the likelihood of a genetic test being positive. Um, in fact, we really think that, that based on the genetic test, we are stratifying different subgroups of HCM. Um, this is a summary slide from the International HCM and MRI study, which um, both Yale and Michigan contributed to. Um, and the overall general findings were that um, sarcomere mutation HCM was much more likely associated again with the reverse curve septal um, thickening pattern, as well as more extensive fibrosis in the septum. Alpha tract obstruction, although we've thought in the past as being pathognomonic for HCM, um, was more prevalent in the sarcomere mutation negative group, likely due to a selection bias for diagnosis. Taking this concept further at Michigan, we um, asked whether, um, based on the genetic test result, does that influence how likely we are to find uh, individuals through family screening that would be subsequently diagnosed with HCM? The classic guidelines have not separated these entities, so they uh, equally recommend family screening for all individuals with HCM, regardless of age of diagnosis or other factors. Um, what we found was that individuals with positive genetic test result were uh, much more likely to have a family history of HCM and much more likely, regardless of family history, to have family members subsequently diagnosed with HCM, whereas those with a negative genetic test result, particularly if the family history was negative, had an extremely low yield of uh, family screening being positive. We concluded that a prior family history and genetic testing distinguish familial from non-familial HCM, where really the genetic test is separating out a Mendelian form of HCM that's autosomal dominant from a more complex genetics form of HCM that's non-familial and probably multifactorial with age being the most important factor in development. And I think this is really important in clinical management because in the individuals with the positive genetic test result, not only were a, a large number subsequently identified based on screening recommendations that we made from the clinic, but a third of these individuals had adverse events following the screening-based diagnosis. Moreover, 50% of family members did not have screening. And so I think this really highlights how uh, important our role is, not at just the initial visit when we meet individuals with HCM, but at all follow-up visits to really emphasize the importance that their family members have screening. In contrast, the individuals with a negative genetic test result, particularly when the family history was negative, had a, um, their, when in the rare cases where family members were diagnosed, it was a late age diagnosis without adverse events. Again, just really emphasizing that these are different conditions. Um, and again, similar to other studies, we found a high rate of outflow tract obstruction in the genetic test uh, negative group, emphasizing how this should not be used as a variable to decide whether HCM is familial or not. So at Michigan, we've adopted this approach to um, identifying likelihood of Mendelian autosomal dominant HCM and how aggressive to be about family screening versus the non-familial form. On the right, if the genetic test is negative and the family history is negative, then 
based on the clinical profile and, and largely the septal morphology and age of presentation. Um, we may view that as a multifactorial non-familial HCM. Somewhat cautiously, we still recommend a one-time screening for adult family members, then with the option to convert to standard screening if there's any positive individual. But this allows us to really focus our energy on the individuals with more clearly autosomal dominant familial HCM. Around the time we published that, reassuringly, um, Jody Ingalls in Sydney, Australia, led a, a similar type of study and, uh, and arrived at a very similar conclusion. So I'm hopeful that this may appear in the guidelines um, that are coming out, but um, yet to be seen. So the genetic basis for HCM is now known to be primarily mutations in sarcomere contractile unit genes. Um, although genetic testing panels have continued to expand, additional genes added on outside of these core group of sarcomere genes have a, a relatively weak level of evidence and uh, contribute very little to the genetic testing yield. Overall, from, um, from the International Share Registry, which both Michigan and Yale contribute to, uh, we find a, about half of individuals are found to have a genetic variant in a sarcomere gene with 42% uh, of those having a, a variant we can clearly define as pathogenic um, and an additional 10% as being a variant of unknown significance that just hasn't been adjudicated well enough to prove its pathogenicity. Looking at the sarcomere positive group in the SHARE registry um, in the study from Ho et al. And, uh, circulation in 2018, we find that the vast majority of HCM that's genetically defined is due to mutations in the thick filament genes, myosin heavy chain and myosin binding protein C. Thin filament genes uh, make up a much smaller subset, about 10% of HCM overall, and uh, um, sorry, 10% of genetic HCM, and less than 5% of HCM overall. So in clinical studies, primarily what, uh, what individuals are investigating when they're studying HCM is thick filament HCM. I think this is important for our understanding because the thin filament variants do have a, a, a little different clinical profile. So looking back at the two cases side by side and, and how our knowledge of genetics might influence our thinking about these very different individuals, if we put them side by side, as, as such, um, we see that these individuals, if, if they were enrolled in a clinical study at age 23 and 65 respectively, were each followed for 13 years. And so if approached from a, a, a traditional clinical study, um, st study design, these individuals would have been followed prospectively for survival analysis and so forth from the time of entry into the study and the time of diagnostic testing and followed for the same length of time, but obviously are very different individuals. And I just highlight that this is a, a major limitation to this, uh, uh, to a traditional study um, design approach because of how the age interacts and can conflate differences in the groups. All of the outcomes uh, that occur with HCM um, or nearly all like heart failure, AFib and so forth are also age prevalent conditions. So you can easily imagine how older age individuals can bias toward events that are more uh, age-related, whereas young individuals with these events would be um, similarly weighted in, in, in such a study without considering how abnormal these events are to occur in a young patient. So really, we should be considering um, the, these events from the time of birth, where an individual with sarcomere mutation has that condition from age zero, has a period of preclinical myo myocardial hypertrophy then develops these complications early in life, whereas the old age onset HCM is likely multifactorial. Probably genetic variants contribute, but they're probably individually have a low effect size and are required to be additive in the setting of other environmental exposures, predominantly age-related remodeling, hypertension, obesity, etc. Again, uh, if considered from the point of um, diagnosis, these would then be followed the same length of time, but not captured in a typical survival analysis where events are then censored after the first event. The individual with sarcomere mutation and severe HCM then goes on to have uh, sometimes progressive heart failure potentially debilitating. Um, 
In the share registry, when we um, analyzed time to events, we therefore looked from age, uh, age of birth, because we viewed the presence of a sarcomere gene mutation to be present at time zero, and therefore any event should be adjudicated following that. And this approach, I think, is important for understanding the natural history of the condition. As clearly shown here, individuals with sarcomere mutation, HCM in green, had events much early that, earlier than individuals without sarcomere mutations in red, with individuals with variants of unknown significance in the middle and blue. So sarcomere mutation patients had a younger age of diagnosis, earlier onset AFib, greater lifetime risk, earlier onset heart failure, and greater lifetime risk an earlier risk of sudden cardiac death and a greater lifetime risk. So my hope is going forward that we will view this condition as a, um, with a greater nuance of time dependency and a, a greater emphasis on lifetime risk. Um, so the next section um, specifically discuss mechanisms that, uh, that I've been working on in the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes pertinent to myosin binding protein C3 HCM. Uh, mutations in myosin binding protein C are the most common cause of HCM. In the share registry, <clears throat> at, uh, um, in 9,400 patients, sarcomere mutations were present in 49%, and of those, 59% were in the gene myosin binding protein C3. The nomenclature is a little confusing, so the protein name is MYBP-C, so I'll refer to the mRNA and protein separately going forward by those names. Uh, myosin binding protein C uh, serves a regulatory function primarily in heart muscle as opposed to a structural function. It regulates the speed at which the thin and thick filaments slide past each other during contraction. And importantly, it, it is only located within the C zone of myofilament shown here as the um, yellow structures. So as the thin filament begins to overlap into the C zone, the myosin binding protein C uh, slows down the uh, sliding velocity as it approaches peaks, as it approaches peak contraction. So as such, it serves as a molecular brake pedal during contraction. Most myosin binding protein C3 mutations are truncating and therefore have a predicted loss of function. So this was 90% of the mutations in the in a share registry. Truncating mutation means that there's a frame shift or nonsense mutation that results in a premature termination codon. So we refer to these as truncating as though they're going to encode a protein. So truncating mutations would cause mRNA transcripts to produce a truncated protein, but nonsense, a process called nonsense mediated RNA decay prevents translation of these uh, transcripts by a, a degradation process. So the truncated protein may or not actually be expressed, and it depends on the particular gene where the mutation is. Um, and uh, to try to understand whether truncating mutations, whether the location or type of mutation might play a role in the disease pathogenesis, we did an analysis from the SHARE registry and looked at the distribution of truncating mutations across a large number of individuals in SHARE and found that they were uh, largely homogeneously spread throughout the gene. So each black line reflects a, a unique truncating myosin binding protein C mutation causative of HCM in the share registry. So we can see that they're equivalently present in the N-terminal domain of the protein extending to the C-terminal do domain. Moreover, uh, when bend into different categories based on where the location of the mutation was, we found that the out, uh, composite outcome of heart failure and arrhythmic events was similar um, regardless of the location of the truncation mutation. So this suggests that the pathogenesis is similar across truncating mutations throughout the gene. Hypothetical mechanisms of truncating mutations uh, in myosin binding protein C um, have been put forward and, and, and I'll list the four main hypotheses that have been described in the literature. The first is that the premature termination codon mutation or the truncating mutation then signals nonsense mediated RNA decay, that there's no compensation in at the RNA or protein level. This reduces the myosin binding protein C protein dose and then leads to a contractile defect because myosin binding protein C is no longer able to regulate the thick filament contractile velocity. The second hypothesis is that premature termination codon mutations 
um, may lead to incomplete nonsense de decay and a truncated myosin binding protein C protein is generated, which then may serve as a poison peptide and interfere with uh, function in the myocyte. Thirdly, the, the PTC mutation may lead to nonsense decay, but then the nonsense decay itself may lead to cellular toxicity and cause abnormal cardiomyocyte function. And fourth, the PTC mutation may lead to nonsense RNA decay, reduced mRNA, and then myosin binding protein C may then compensate, but then there could be unintended consequences in the myocyte leading to secondary effects of compensation that dysregulate myosin, myocyte growth, causing hypertrophy primarily. To try to tackle the, these hypotheses, I derived genome engineered models of iPS cells. And I wasn't going to give much uh, background on iPS cells uh, today because I know you have uh, great investigators there who have given grand rounds and have probably had other grand rounds on this topic. Um, but we use the iPS cells um, to then, uh, which have the capacity to turn into different cells in the body. We direct them to differentiate into cardiomyocytes and then study structure and function in them. Um, one limitation to iPS cells of studying cells from different patients could be that the cells themselves might have a tendency to have different cellular phenotypes independent of the mutation one's trying to study. So to avoid this, um, one strategy has been to perform gene, gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, I also wasn't gonna give much background on the CRISPR-Cas9 since that's been in the press and I'm sure in your grand rounds before. But we use the CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce um, specific mutations in myosin binding protein C, creating a series of iPS cell lines that were identical other than the specific myosin binding protein C mutation we introduced. And then we introduced uh, mutations in different locations to try to um, address the various hypotheses I went through in the previous slide. So specifically uh, in one line, I deleted the promoter of myosin binding protein C. So this would lead to um, complete ablation of expression of myosin binding protein C without the possibility of any truncated protein being expressed. And another um, isogenic iPS cell line, I created a mutation at the canonical translational start site. So this iPS line from that allele would, uh, would make the mRNA, but then it wouldn't be translated into protein. And there wouldn't be nonsense mediated decay of the RNA because no premature termination codon exists. It just um, doesn't uh, translate off of the canonical start site. Um, I also compared these to two patient lines and then at a similar location to the patient lines introduced uh, typical HCM truncating mutations um, at that location. And in one of those lines, um, I also tagged the N-terminus of the protein with the flag epitope tag to enable us to detect any potential truncated protein. Um, since this hadn't been done before, I'll just briefly show the approach on the promoter um, deletion line, which is that um, I identified areas using the ENCODE database that are conserved across species uh, um, at the five prime end of myosin binding protein C and, and also exhibited DNA's hypersensitivity peak clusters, indicating this is an open chromatin area and, and highly regulated. So identify this is the most likely uh, promoter region and then use two uh, guide RNAs to target a complete removal of that um, section. The promoter deletion line um, then was validated to have a totally absent expression of myosin binding protein C as shown by this immunofluorescence image. Um, Structurally, the absence of myosin binding protein C did not lead to any problems in formation of myofilaments or organization of myofilaments, as shown here in the alpha actinin images. Um, to create the frame shift and flag uh, lines, um, I used a targeting guide RNA in exon 27 of myosin binding protein C, and then to introduce the uh, flag um, tag line. I, in a second round, um, used homologous recombination with the flag epitope to label the N-terminal section of myosin binding protein C, and then confirm that this was in phase with the uh, uh, with the um, exon 27 mutation. In other words, the 
mRNA containing the premature termina termination codon would also have a flag um, epitope signal at the end terminus that would enable us to specifically detect any translated protein with a very sensitive antibody. So we would expect then if that there's nonsense mediated degradation and absent um, protein that we wouldn't be able to detect it. But if that there was residual C-terminal truncated protein expressed, we would be able to detect it with sensitive antibodies. Our general pipeline for generating IPS cardiomyocytes, we started with pluripotent stem cells as shown here, um, uh, grew them in monolayer cultures and differentiated with them with standard techniques, um, modulating Wnt expression. Um, we purified the cardiomyocytes at the day 12 to 15 post-differentiation at the time. We were using magnetic beads to sort for um, a cell membrane marker of cardiomyocytes called SERPA. Uh, I think this is important to create very high purity of cardiomyocytes going into phenotyping to maintain consistency across experiments. Um, and then we performed biochemical assays and testing in uh, monolayer cultures. For structure and function, we used a micropatterning technique that I'll describe uh, later. Um, so first we looked at protein levels, and, and this is a um, previous report um, by our collaborator, uh, Mike Previs in Vermont, where um, we had sent him um, human heart tissue uh, with HCM to look at the relative ratio of myosin binding protein C in the heart compared to um, other myofilament proteins. And we showed in, in the heart, um, tissue that clearly there was a reduction in myosin binding protein C protein. In, in other words, that there was a reduced reduction in the myosin binding protein C dose, um, also referred to as haploinsufficiency. So our first question with the stem cell cardiomyocytes is would we see the same finding and would it be different across the different uh, genotypes? And um, I was surprised to find that uh, using the same techniques from Mike Previs's lab, that we found no difference between controls and the heterozygous myosin binding protein C line. So despite there being nonsense decay or reduction of protein, or theoretical reduction of protein, we didn't actually detect any reduction in the myosin binding protein C levels, except for in the homozygous, uh, a homozygous truncating line that had totally absent myosin binding protein C. This was a surprising result and, um, and different than some other publications. Uh, but I felt like um, I think our methods were very rigorous using um, mass spectroscopy to quantify these levels. So, so this demonstrated that myosin binding protein C protein level is compensated in early development, but to reconcile our result from the human heart tissue, compensation must be lost by the time of hypertrophic remodeling in patients. So, um, so our question was, does compensation then occur through mRNA upregulation to account for the nonsense mediated RNA decay or through compensatory mechanisms at the protein level? To answer this, we looked at RNA levels and the different uh, isogenic myosin binding protein C IPS lines and found that the total mRNA abundance was reduced in the truncating heterozygous variants as expected. Um, except for the heterozygous start site mutation. So remember this mutation is altering the translational start site, but there's no premature termination codon. So we did not ex expect this level to be reduced. And indeed it was statistically similar to the controls. The homozygous frame shift mutation did have a, a, a more pronounced reduction um, with 100% of this uh, RNA being the mutant isoform or allele. Um, looking at the relative myosin binding protein C mutant mRNA, we see that the heterozygous start site, again, because there's no nonsense mediated decay, makes up 50% of the total, whereas the heterozygous frame shift um, has a marked reduction in uh, uh, the mutant allele as compared to the expected 50%, um, with a similar finding in the homozygous frame shift. Uh, using RNA-seq, um, I then looked at all RNA levels across the genome and found that the reduction in MYBPC3 mRNA is isolated, so no other sarcomere genes are affected. And I think this is interesting because there um, seems to be a common control program that, uh, that regulates these RNA levels across the myofilament genes. And so when one is down, there's not, there doesn't seem to be any specific mechanism to then 
counteract that reduction in that particular gene. So it's dragged down by itself without a innate co compensatory ability of the cells to bring it back up. Um, so myosin binding protein C level then we found was compensated despite myosin binding protein C3 mRNA being re reduced. So this leads to the question, does the protein level compensate because mRNA is not rate limiting or does it occur because MIBPC protein degradation is downregulated? Um, so to answer this question uh, with Mike Previs, um, we designed a, an assay to measure synthesis and degradation of myosin binding protein C. And the way we did this was purified um, cardiomyocytes, in this case, by lactate purification. And then at the time of replating, we labeled uh, the cardiomyocytes with deuterated leucine, which would enable us to detect any newly synthesized protein following plating these cells on monolayers. Then we collected samples at different points to look at rates of synthesis and degradation of myosin binding protein C as well as other proteins. We found uh, indeed that myosin binding protein C synthesis was reduced as would be expected if the RNA amount is rate limiting. Um, but in contrast, myosin binding protein C degradation was also reduced. And so then this would presumably be through a compensatory mechanism. The overall stoichiometry of myosin binding protein C to myosin was therefore maintained with no significant difference across time points. So next we look to see whether using um, the combination of uh, isogenic lines, if we could detect truncated myosin binding protein C that might support a poison peptide hypothesis. In the homozygous iPS cardiomyocytes, uh, we were able to detect very low levels of truncated proteins, but um, when quantifying by mass spec, these only accounted for less than 1% of what would be expected for the normal uh, control cardiomyocytes. Then using the flag labeled C-terminal truncated uh, mutant line, we really found no evidence of presence of truncated protein in the heterozygous line. So we concluded that the poison peptide hypothesis is unlikely to be true. So um, based on these findings, we then wanted to determine whether there were any structural or functional defects or, or whether the uh, compensation in protein levels um, would prevent any structural or functional defects in the heterozygous lines. Um, and IPS cardiomyocytes are innately heterogeneous in, shell, in cell shape and size. And so um, this leads to difficulties in confounding, looking at different size and shapes of cells and trying to compare structure and function. So we used a, um, a, the technique of micropatterning to control cell shape and size. And this is um, done through a process similar to uh, using an ink stamp where you can very precisely deposit adhesive proteins onto a cell culture substrate to constrain the growth of cardiomyocytes. Um, so this is an example of printing of a fluorescent adhesive protein showing that we can deposit very small uh, regions of the protein where we intend to on substrates to enable the cells to only attach and grow into these small shapes. And this is an example of a micro-patterned IPS, cardi a single IPS cardiomyocyte onto such a pattern. So whereas um, without, without this sort of technique, the cardiomyocytes might grow in unpredictable ways um, with the micro-patterning, the myofibrils all line up with the long axis of the um, stamped region and exhibit, exhibit a high degree of myofibrillar organization. We can also use this technique to um, analyze 2D tissue formation by, um, by doing wider patterns uh, that are also eccentric in nature and looking at cell uh, attachment points. So using this technique, we found that really across the heterozygous and homozygous uh, mutations in myosin binding protein C, that structure was not perturbed. Even in the homozygous myosin binding protein C knockout, the, Myofibrils formed normally with a normal amount of organization, uh, similar sarcomere links and periodicity of sarcomere units. 
we observed though that uh, individual cells had a, a variety of um, density in the myofibrils that they formed, uh, ranging from very low or sparse myofibrillar deposition to more dense myofibrils. So we tried to take advantage of this to see if there was an innate tendency for cellular hypertrophy in the, um, in the myosin binding protein C mutant cells um, by counting myofibrils uh, that extended lengthwise across each individual cell. And we found in over 100 cells per group that re there really wasn't any cellular hypertrophic phenotype. So we concluded that at this very early developmental stage that these cells, even in the total absence of myosin binding protein C, are pre-hypertrophic and probably shouldn't be used to study hypertrophy pathways directly. To analyze the contractile function, we performed this micropatterning technique onto polyacrylamide gels that can be tuned to have um, whatever stiffness uh, one desires. So in our case, we made eight kilopascal polyacrylamide gels, which would enable cells to contract along with the direction of the myofibrillar um, formation. And so here's an, a representative example of a, of a high quality IPS cardiomyocyte contracting in a single uniaxial direction on a polyacrylamide gel. Um, underneath, in, inside the gel, we um, disperse fluorescent bees, which enables us to track the direction of the uh, displacement in the gel and calculate a force using previously published techniques. Um, so th those are then mapped using a computational algorithm to generate a force map at each point in time that the imaging was done over. So we can obtain high temporal resolution with a, around 20 or 30 milliseconds using this technique. Um, importantly, uh, we found that because of the variability in the myofibrillar formation across IPS cardiomyocytes, that we also needed to image in every analyzed cell um, the myofibrillar structure to make sure we we're comparing apples to apples. And, um, so here's an example of uh, imaged myofibrils with a cell permeable dye called steractin that um, doesn't require any special techniques to label the um, myofibrils um, prior to imaging the contractile force. Okay, um, so using the, this technique called traction force microscopy, we could uh, generate contractile force curves for each um, cell we analyzed. And um, we found that really there was no difference in the heterozygous uh, isogenic uh, mutant myosin binding protein C lines in terms of maximal traction force, um, but there was a reduction in the homozygous mutant line. Um, we normalize contractile velocity to the max fractional shortening because of the large amount of variability across individual cells and, and found that um, there was an increase in contractile velocity in the homozygous frame shift line, but not in other lines. So to conclude this section, um, myosin binding protein C3 truncating mutations cause a loss of function with reduced MYBPC3 mRNA, and this reduces the synthesis of myosin binding protein C. In early development, there appears to be an innate capacity to compensate for this reduced synthesis via reduced MYBPC degradation. This capacity to compensate must be diminished by time of overt HCM, but we do not yet know when disease, during disease evolution this compensation is lost. Compensated myosin binding protein C levels prevent contractile dysfunction in IPS cardiomyocytes. Uh, with complete ablation, contractile deceleration is the primary um, feature that we found to be dysregulated. Reducing myosin binding protein C degradation may therefore be a viable treatment option upstream of contractile dysfunction. Importantly, this also indicates that treatment of contractile dysfunction upstream of this myosin binding protein C reduction could be problematic problematic, highlighting the importance of understanding when this change in HCM heart tissue uh, must occur. Um, so in the next section, I'm going to uh, briefly just uh, re review how our approach to contractile studies and stem cell derived cardiomyocytes has evolved. And I think this is a, has been a critical hurdle in the field and that we've worked hard to overcome because the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, I think, are really a major way that we're going to understand the extent of uh, impairment across a range of genetic conditions and um, inherited cardiomyopathy.
So um, some advantages of iPS cardiomyocytes to um, understand contractile dysregulation are, are that they re replicate human physiology. So they express the same gene variants and isoforms as in patient heart muscle. Um, they can be readily derived from patients, increasing throughput. Uh, they have much greater flexibility for in vitro study and pharmacologic testing compared to rodent cardiomyocytes, which are generally very short-lived in culture if harvested from uh, animals in vivo. And the thousands of genetic variants across many cardiomyopathy-associated genes precludes extensive modeling with uh, rodents. E each rodent model requires a very large investment in both time and money. Um, limitations, though, of the IPS cardiomyocytes include immaturity, heterogeneity, and batch-related variability, and we found that these are really quite large hurdles. In standard uh, culture techniques, IPS cardiomyocytes form, uh, again, heterogeneous shapes, and the connections are random depending on the seeding density of the cells and, and how their individual connections are. So uh, these videos just highlight that. This is a live cell image of a contracting IPS cardiomyocyte cluster on a soft uh, hydrogel uh, simulating um, in vivo heart muscle elasticity. And this is sh showing the same cluster of cells labeled with the um, uh, actin label that I mentioned earlier. And what you can see is just by a random uh, deposition of these cells that there can be a very strongly contracting uh, regions in some areas, but then these are electrically coupled to adjacent cells that may be overpowered. And so despite the electrical coupling and simultaneous depolarization, some cells may actually undergo stretch, reading, uh, um, meaning that the cells experience a very non-physiologic uh, biophysical milieu. Um, so this shows the various uh, orientations of contractile di uh, directions just in the small cluster and um, highlighting an area of contraction during depolarization and a paradoxical area of stretch. So I think um, we could agree that this really isn't a system that would be conducive to precise measurements of contractile function that might be very subtly perturbed in the presence of sarcomere gene variants, uh, most of which are compatible with um, life into adulthood. So the, the, IPA, the micro patterning techniques um, helped us to constrain geometry, but unfortunately we still encountered a very broad uh, degree of variability across individual cells. And to highlight that, this is just showing across control cells the extent of variability and contractile force generated in these micro pattern cells. And you can see that the standard deviation of 487 is almost half of the mean value, meaning that the coefficient of variation is very high and that the sample size required to detect subtle differences would be extremely high. And given the low throughput nature of this method, it makes it difficult to do high resolution studies. Further highlighting um, the variability, we found that when labeling these cells with actin, um, we found some cells that had very dense myofibrils uh, achieving very high contractile forces, whereas other cells, even from the same batch of cells, might have very sparse formation of myofibrils with a very low contractile force. In a linear regression model, we see that as the myofibrillar area goes up, so does the contractile force. And so we think that in IPS cardiomyocytes, it's really important to measure and quantify the myofibrillar density. But this technique is still quite low throughput. So our, my lab has been working very hard to improve this method because we, we really think this technology is critical for understanding um, genetic cardiomyopathies. Um, so we've developed a new system where instead of single cells, we take advantage of the improved physiology and uh, viability of cardiomyocytes when in contact with each other in tissues. But we did not want to use 3D tissues because of um, concerns for the variability of the uh, stro stromal or fibroblast cells um, that are required to maintain coherence of these tissues in culture. So we used a, a similar type of micropatterning approach as done with the single cells, but we found when this was scaled up that we achieved a much higher throughput and robustness of individual tissues. So you can view this as like a muscle strip as one might have um, done from dissected uh, rodent tissue, but these can be maintained in culture and have a lot of plasticity for various types of studies. We found that uh, myo we find that myofibrillar alignment is highly organized in these tissues with a high degree of reproducibility.
Um, we've developed our own method for measuring the contractile function of these uh, tissues using a cross-correlation method to track individual regions of interest um, by using surface uh, pixel features. So this would be sort of like um, speckle tracking and echocardiography. And because of the high reproducibility of the uniaxial contractions, it makes it straightforward then to measure displacements and velocities of these tissues with time. So we can do serial measurements and uh, paired analysis for pharmacologic analyses, um, highlighting uh, how this improves uh, pharmacologic testing. Uh, these are um, unpatterned cardiomyocytes with uh, measurements using our contractile algorithm with uh, increasing doses of mavicamptin, which is a myosin ATPase inhibitor. And we find that although there's a reduction that the um, statistical power here is very limited. Um, as, in contrast with the with our micro um, tissue approach, we find a very highly reproducible um, dose reduction with mavicamptin. And finally, we find that the this improved biomechanical milieu also improves uh, cardiac maturation with increased expression of um, electrophysiologic mar markers of maturation, such as the sodium channel SCN5A. Um, the patch clamping achieves a more mature profile. Um, this is courtesy of Lori Isom's lab, and, uh, and resting membrane potentials are much more physiolog physiologic, uh, uh, just around minus 80 millivolts. Um, by further optimizing the media of these tissues, we can also achieve a more mature profile of um, myofilament markers, in particular cardiac troponin I, which has been um, which is the prominent ad adult isoform, but has been hard to achieve consistently in iPS cardiomyocytes. We're able to uh, achieve a very high level expression. <clears throat> okay, so um, this last, last section, uh, I'm just gonna do very uh, quickly, but I, I, I would just um, highlight a, a specific story of how gen genetic specific mechanisms in dilated cardiomyopathy are important. Um, so briefly, this is a case of a 45-year-old woman who presents with a history of cardiac arrest for genetic evaluation. Post-cardiac arrest, she was found to have an EF of 45, normal RV function. Mother had a history of dilated cardiomyopathy with EF of 35 and a history of vasospasm-induced MI with elevated troponin. At the time of evalu evaluation, she was asymptomatic, tolerating goal-directed therapy well, and EF was 50. Exam showed that she had coarse and curly hair, but otherwise was normal. Her genetic test showed a desmoplakin frame shift or truncating mutation. Um, so desmoplakin cardiomyopathy, uh, we reported recently in, in work that we did um, with Dan and others, um, has several defining features that really separate it from other forms of cardiomyopathy. And I think is a great example of how genetic diagnosis can lead us to a improved understanding of um, pathogenesis and features of, a, of cardiomyopathy. Um, so we've, we found overall in our uh, series of 107 desmoplakin patients that PVCs were very frequent. MRI delayed enhancement was almost always present. Fibrosis almost always followed a subepicardial distribution that's distinct from uh, typical dilated cardiomyopathy or HCM. The fibrosis in um, almost all cases preceded systolic dysfunction, indicating a, likely a, a mechanism of fibrosis leading to systolic dysfunction rather than the other way around. And despite a molecular role similar to placophyl and other ARVC-associated genes, um, ARVC was present in only a small subset. And interestingly, um, desmoplakin cardiomyopathy was associated with episodic chest pain in 20% of patients. This was, um, in most of these, associated with the troponin elevation and normal coronary angiography. So these were significant acute episodes of chest pain where the patients went to the hospital and um, got caths in most cases. Sometimes these were dis misdiagnosed, as in the family history of the case I presented, as either vasospasm, myocarditis, or sarcoid. Um, here's a PET scan of, a, of one of these patients that appeared as sarcoid based on um, an area of FDG uptake on PET scan. So in the, um, in the patient I presented, uh, uh, the patient was very interested in, uh, this is my first family with desmoplakin cardiomyopathy, and uh, she was a nurse and just extraordinarily interested in her family history, and so sent me lots of photos. And this one I think is very interesting because she had tracked all the individuals in her family with 
coarse hair. And, um, and so we can see looking back that these individuals probably had desmoplakin cardiomyopathy, some of whom experienced cardiac events and others who didn't. Um, around the time of diagnosis of this family, they also discovered that, that individuals in, in uh, this other branch of the family were developing adverse events. And in particular, um, these individuals who were diagnosed in, as teenagers with cardiomyopathy. And so just another example of how um, the uh, penetrance and expressivity of, of genetic cardiomyopathies can be quite variable from a 36-year-old with uh, cardiac arrest to a 77-year-old living with her cardiomyopathy on medications to this individual who's now undergone a heart transplant. Um, so genetic basis of dilated cardiomyopathy is now well substantiated across a range of conditions and really should be um, considered a, a across all of these conditions as a potential underlying cause. Withdrawal of cardiomyopathy medications, probably because of the genetic substrate, um, should not be stopped even when the EF recovers. And it's very important to screen family members in dilated cardiomyopathy, even if the family history is negative. Um, so I'm going to just skip to my conclusion slide. Uh, so in conclusion, familial HCM is fundamentally different than non-familial HCM, and genetic diagnosis is critical. Myosin binding protein C3 HCM is mostly due to truncating mutations that exert a similar effect, causing loss of function through reduced MYBPC synthesis as the primary mechanism. And innate compensatory mechanism maintains these levels early in development, but is lost by the time of development of HCM. IPS cardiomyocytes can be effectively used to study contractile function in cardiomyopathy subtypes using bioengineering approaches. And DSP cardiomyopathy is a DCM subtype that requires a different risk prediction and management approach. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge everyone in my lab at the University of Michigan, my postdoc mentor, Charlene Day, um, and, uh, and collaborators. Um, well, th thank you very much, and I'll uh, open for questions. Thanks, Adam. That was terrific. There's two ways people can ask questions. One is by just unmuting themselves and asking, and the other would be to submit a question in the chat room, and then I'll read the question for you. Great. So, uh, Dan, if I can start with the one question. Uh, Adam, excellent presentation. I have uh, two quick questions. One is that you said there's a rate limiting uh, for uh, myosin binding protein C3 is actually protein degradation, but you didn't mention the mechanism. Is it through ubiquitination, or do we know exactly? so that they can actually initiate treatment. And second is that you mentioned about the 10% that are missense mutations. Did you do any functional analysis to, first of all, validate those mutations as causal, and also show if this is, a, again, loss of function, or it could be a dominant negative effect or in, on the missense mutation, because uh, these are very rare. Sure. So, um... The first question was, um, do we know the mechanism of the abnormal degradation or the compensatory degradation alteration in the heterozygous um, MYBPC3 mutant carriers? Um, so I, did, I didn't show the data, but in, in the paper, um, I, I did a, a large RNA-seq look to see if we could find any pathways that might indicate where the degradation was um, uh, different. And in and, and the highest hits with the gene ontology approach and looking by um, just dysregulated genes was in the chaperone pathways. So um, in that paper, um, just because of the amount of stuff that had already accumulated, I didn't go into the specific mechanism. And um, Charlene Day is going to be picking up most of the work looking at the degradation because that's the main focus of her lab. So I don't know whether she'll talk about that in her grand rounds that she has coming up. But we think it's probably something to do with chaperones and maybe the system gets overwhelmed and that's why um, HCM evolves at some point later in the tissue of HCM patients and perhaps alterations in that pathway or individual variation could explain why some individuals develop more severe HCM than others. And certainly it makes a very attractive therapeutic target if we could find a particular pathway that's specific to cardiomyocytes and could be targeted safely to increase myosin binding protein C levels, maybe, maybe that could be um, a, a therapeutic target. So the, the question was missense mutation. The second question was missense mutations. So the vast majority of the mutations were truncating, 90%. Um, we did very careful adjudication of all the missense variants. Uh, I think that's been a, uh, 
a difficulty in the literature is that they're not always very uh, well adjudicated, but due to the large numbers in the share database, um, um, we did very careful adjudication. And all that's published in a circulation genomics precision medicine paper recently. Um, so we ended up finding, I think, 20 total missense mutations, if I remember right. Um, there was some clustering effect of these in some domains. And in that same paper, we um, did a, um, some assay to look at stability of these proteins. At least a subset of them do um, make the protein unstable, so they degrade more rapidly, particularly the ones in the C10 domain. And we showed that with cyclohexamide pulse chase assay and so forth. And so in those, I think they act just like the truncating. They're just a loss of function. Um, the, there is a, um, the, the most common mutation in HCM altogether is the myosin binding protein CR502W. And I don't yet know whether that's a dominant negative or a loss of function. I would guess, based on the rest of them, that it's just loss of function. But it hasn't been proven. It's not really been studied extensively. I must add another that's, super um, talk. I've got, okay. a, I've got a question for you. Um, getting back to the first section where you're talking about familial versus non-familial, a number that I don't, I'm not sure if you gave us was of people who present clearly familial, clearly young onset, um, how many of those have an identified mutation? And do you think there are mutations that we just haven't found yet for HCM? Or do you think that, the, uh, that it's pretty well laid out by now? Um, th that's a great question. Yeah, I, th I think about this a lot. I, I think it's actually very well laid out. I mean, my general clinical intuition is I rarely come across a young patient who has bulky reverse curve hypertrophy and, and the test is negative. I mean, um, when we looked through that study, we tried carefully to look and see what percentage that might be. And our best estimate based on that cohort was around 10% that we think that maybe about 10% of like clearly familial HCM, where it looks like sarcomere positive HCM in the adult population, we think that maybe 10% of it is genetically elusive. Like we just don't know the genetic cause. Um, I suspect that these are going to be really hard to find, and they might often they might be more um, you know two hit kind of things where it's it's just going to uh, take large numbers and a lot of searching to find the causes. Um, did that did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, yep, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, Adam, this is Jeff Bender. I have a question. First of all, that's absolutely wonderful work uh, that you've been doing. In the never-ending search for genotype-phenotype correlations, I guess, connected to structure function analysis, do you have any idea at this point? Because to me, it's still a mystery why, for example, a loss of break on thin film, thick, thin filament sliding would cause reverse curve hypertrophy, um, or even cellular hypertrophy, and maybe even more so the disarray that's observed that may lead to electrical coupling problems. I mean, it's a very fundamental question, but I think we're, we're still missing that. Yeah, so I don't know why the septum's more involved. I don't think anybody really has a coherent hypothesis that can be proven experimentally, like why the septum specifically, and the best we can do is just sort of guess why the septum is. So some people have thought maybe it's just the particular biomechanical context of the septum and the sorts of forces that it um, undergoes may make it more susceptible to remodeling. Another potential hypothesis that would be also difficult to prove would be if the, if the septum, um, some of it derives embryologically from a, from, the, uh, from a different heart field, like different precursor cells. So maybe those have a little bit different in the transcriptional profile and, and makes it more um, prone to remodeling. I, I don't have a great um, explanation or really a great idea of how to experimentally prove that. We also have patients in the clinic who maybe one family member has the typical reverse curve hypertrophy, but another might have apical HCM. And why that occurs, I, I don't really, no, I presume just other genetic background things that may make it uh, more susceptible. There was a second part. What was the second? Well, no, part? just just the whole the driver of hypertrophy and disarray based right. on this so, loss of break of, of thin, thin, thick filaments. Yeah. Right? So I think yeah, I, I think there's um, the Seidman lab has put forth a hypothesis to try to tie together the myosin binding protein C with myosin. Um, heavy chain variants, and they think it's um, that it alters the number of myosin heads available for 
um, contractile cycling, and, and they've tied this together with the whole story about um, using Mavicampton to reduce the availability of heads. I would say that it's not um, that 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 is still somewhat uh, controversial, and we don't totally know. Um, I think. Our uh, our data does suggest that contractile velocity is increased in the absence of myosin binding protein C. So I think the most likely theory would be that that this uh, increased contractile velocity puts some sort of cellular biomechanical stress, then leading to hypertrophy. And my sense is that the fibrosis and the disarray, although occasionally people have described this in cells or some sort of like innate process, I I suspect that that's not true. I think that it's really a uh, downstream consequence that the hypertrophy happens and then there might be mechanical injury or stress and then this leads to fibrosis secondarily and then the um, disarray occurs as like a downstream consequence. And that's just my speculation. Let me jump in for one second. We're, we're coming, uh, we're a little bit over time. I'm happy to let the conversation continue because we can't just go down and talk to Adam in the front of Fedkin and there's still a couple more questions. Adam, do you have another minute to stay on the line? No, I have plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. So if people need to drop off, that's understood, but we'll let a few more questions go. Uh, Lorenzo, you had raised your hand. Uh, hi, Dr. Helm. This was an amazing talk. I just, I think you started touching on this a bit about the mechanisms of hypercontractility and, you know, the, the unification with mycin mutations and the use of Mavicampton. But I was wondering, in the specific mutation that you studied in your paper, if not Mavicampton as a therapeutic option, what would you suggest, like, pathways that could be targeted? to sort of prevent or ameliorate the, the disease that is being seen in those patients. Um, yeah, th thanks, Lorenzo. So I think in broad strokes, I could envision three different sorts of potential ways to go after myosin binding protein C. And one would be to accept that you're gonna have the haploinsufficiency, but then use um, some drug to return the uh, effects of that on contractile function back to normal. And I think, um, Maybe that will work with Mavicampton, but I, but I don't know. I think it remains to be seen. And part of the problem is with myosin binding protein C that there's not been any experimental animals. So um, the heterozygous myosin binding protein C mouse does not actually have a hypertrophic phenotype, and so it can't be studied. So um, I think really for myosin binding protein C, although I would love for Mavicampton to actually work for reducing remodeling, I think it's not been experimentally proven. Um, and um, in the clinical studies so far, what's really been shown is that it reduces outflow tract obstruction. So I think that we know for sure, and that extends to myosin binding protein C. There's certainly reasons to be optimistic about it, but I, I don't know that it's been you know, clearly experimentally proven. The second approach could be to replace myosin binding protein C3 through gene therapy. So just avoiding the issue of um, myosin binding protein C absence. That obviously has all the um, hurdles of gene therapy, but gene therapy is improving. So I think it's possible that that could be a viable solution, at least for a more se severely affected subset of individuals, but would require us to be much more savvy about predicting who those severely affected individuals are early and in introducing the gene therapy at an early time point before reversion modeling occurs. And then thirdly, the third major option that I see would be something um, as in the first question to um, to affect myosin binding protein C degradation. And so you would introduce some therapy to maintain myosin binding protein C stoichiometry and prevent the contractile dysfunction in the first place. Thanks, Adam. I think we have one more question and then we'll, we'll call it a day. It's an absolutely Great. wonderful talk and I can't thank you enough. Um, Dr. Akar, uh, Fadi Akar has written, great talk. Does your micropatterning technique alter the spontaneous beating rate of your um, induced protein stem cell cardiomyocytes? Do they acquire a more quiescent phenotype consistent with adult mature myocytes? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, great question. So the, uh, my, the beating rate in our differentiation protocols generally ends up at less than half a hertz. So um, so generally, in, in both in the single cells and in the micro tissues, have a, um, a, a very slow beating rate that is more consistent with ventricular cardiomyocytes. In the micro tissues, we get a, a lower beating rate than in the single cells, and it's more consistent. But we've also um, changed our protocol somewhat. So we use um, uh, we depleted our early differentiation steps from uh, retinol 
which drives atrial differentiations is included as a component in B27, which is very common. And we also use a retinol inhibitor. So the combination of these things has resulted in our differentiated cardiomyocytes having a, um, a, a more ventricular profile anyway, but our typical beating rate in our tissues is around 30 beats a minute. Um, well, thank you so much, Adam. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Uh, lovely to have you join us. And next time we'll have you in person. That uh, sounds great. Well, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. I am. Super talk. Okay. Thank you. Take care.